Greetings, and thanks for joining us from around the world today. Uh, my name is Josh Rednick, and I have the pleasure of serving as CEO of American Friends of the Hebrew University. Before we start today's webinar, I want to offer sincere thanks to our colleagues at the Harry S. Truman Institute for the Advancement of Peace, the Hebrew University, especially our friends in the Division of Advancement and External Relations, and our team of volunteers and professionals at American Friends of the Hebrew University. Together, we were able to very quickly plan and implement today's presentation in the wake of the Knesset passing legislation that abolishes the reasonableness doctrine, which the Supreme Court of Israel has employed to evaluate government policies. Today, we will feature three friends with important insights to offer. And please forgive me for making these introductions brief as each of our speakers has a bio that far exceeds what I can share with you today. Joining us are Asher Cohen, president of the Hebrew University, Dan Meridor, who in addition to his life of service to the state and the people of Israel, currently serves as chairman of the Truman Institute Board of Directors, and Netta Barak Koren, a professor of law, a legal scholar, and a cognitive scientist, and a member of the faculty at the Hebrew University known for her expertise on these matters. We have limited time together today, so in order to keep things organized, I invite those of you who are interested in asking questions to submit them via the Q&A section in Zoom. So for now, let's return to the name of today's webinar itself. Where do we go from here? To begin answering that critical question, I'd like to invite my friend and my colleague, Asher Cohen, to get us started. Asher? Thank you, Josh, and hello, everyone. Uh, there are two experts here that I'm sure will give you a full review after me of what's happening right now in Israel. So what I chose to do is to give you an overall picture and especially how the university looks at what is going on right now in Israel. I'll start with the obvious. We are not political players. The Hebrew University is not a political player. We had, for example, numerous uh, elections in the last two, three years in Israel. We never had anything to say about it. Each and every one of our community goes to the elections vote. And this is, as far as we are concerned, what we do. We don't get involved with politics. But we do have values. Values are important to the Hebrew University, as it is important to all uh, universities around the world. And it's important for us. And one of those values is democracy. Democracy is critical. It's a great value that we cherish. And when we need to, we defend democracy as we view it. Uh, as it's obvious, I think, to many of you, democracy is not an easy concept. There are many different versions of liberal democracy around the world. And uh, the US is different from Israel. We are different also from other countries in Europe. We have different rules in order to preserve democracy. But there are some principles that are shared by all democracies. And one of them is the separation between the, ju the du judici judiciary and the legislature. Uh, Different countries use different ways to do it. Uh, many countries have constitution. Israel does not have a constitution. But it does have, or used to have, a, a good separation between the, ju the judiciary and the legislature and the executive branch as well. And uh, we worked according to this principle. And Israel has been a thriving democracy. Now, when you look at democracies around the world, and when you look at dictatorships around the world, you see one big difference. In democracies, when you want to change the rules of the game, changing the constitution, changing anything about the rules of the game, you need wide agreement. And usually in democracies, that's how it's being done. Wide agreement is achieved. And when there is wide agreement, it's typically something that preserves the balance. In dictatorships, you shift it from one to the other very quickly, and we see some examples of this around the world. Which brings us to what's happening right now in Israel. As I said, Israel is a thriving democracy, but the attempts to change 
the rules of the game here in recent months without wide agreement is not a behavior of a democracy. And therefore, we all see the democratic life in Israel as under threat. Again, we have many reasons to believe that Israel will continue to be a democracy. But when there is danger, and this is a sign of a danger, we have to do what we do in order to preserve what is a great value, a cherished value of all of us, democracy. Uh, I want to add one more thing that is important for universities specifically. Although there are occasional deviations from it, generally speaking, universities only do well under democratic rules. There are, of course, some dictatorships that have some good universities, but these universities have very clear faults, very clear problems. Generally speaking, academia can live well when it lives in a democracy. So, what I told you about the threat to the democratic life in Israel is actually also a threat to the academia in Israel. So no wonder that the universities uh, got involved in this particular case in what's happening. And I want to tell you in a few words, what are the principles that guided us during the last few months? Uh, one thing that is very clear to us and we, more or less acted according to it, is that all the research universities tried to coordinate their actions together. It's much more effective when all the universities say what they think about the situation than when only some do it and some don't do it. We have an organization here in Israel where all the presidents of the universities meet regularly and we used that platform in order to voice our opinion as the body of research universities. And we voiced our opinions very clearly. And what we did depended on the situation. I don't know when was the first wave of the legal attempts. The, I think three months ago, when the, when the government came with the entire package of the, the changes or what they call the constitutional revolution, uh, that was a huge threat. When that happened, all the universities, along with many, many other institutions in Israel and the uh, big uh, union of Israel, the Estatut, we all declared a strike. That was around the time that the uh, prime minister tried to fire the defense minister and everyone was shocked. And as a result of that, we all acted accordingly, very, very decisively in order to stop what was a very direct threat. But that this is a rare case, a case where the entire package is thrown at us. Since then, Israel is going for what you know it's going for attempts by the coalition once in a while to do something to change the rules of the game, sometimes this way, sometimes that way. And eventually it turned out to be about the rule of reasonableness or the use of reasonableness in, in court. Uh, as we objected to all the rules of, all the changes in the rules of democracy, we also objected to this rule for two reasons. One, I mentioned before, you do not change rules of the game without wide agreement. And there was no wide agreement about it. And the second reason is that it simply, in its, at least in its current version, it's a bad rule. And maybe the other experts here will explain it better than I do because there are better experts in this particular field. So what we did in this particular case, we again, said what we believe is the case, that the government should not change rules like that without wide agreement. Wide agreement would essentially guarantee that nothing will be extreme, radical, or against democracy. And that's why we did that. Unfortunately, as you know, the government did pass the law. 
and we are still uh, rolling with it, meaning that right now there, there is an appeal to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court is about to take it and uh, discuss it and then decide what to do about it. So we are still in the event. The event is still unfolding in front of our eyes and I cannot say much about it aside from saying that we object to the rule for the two reasons that I mentioned. One, it's not widely agreed upon. Secondly, it's a, a rule that judges all over the world use it. It's a rule that should be used. And the extreme version that is now being uh, the past is threatening this ability of the judiciary to do what it should do. So that's more or less the principle that we operate accordingly. And we are trying to keep doing that. I want to add one more thing that is really, at least from our point of view, very important. While we do strongly, in fact, believe that the moves of the government should not have been taken place, should not have taken place, we have a large community in which some of the members of that community actually support what the government does. It's a minority, but that minority supports what the government does. We know that. As I said, as a university, as a university management, we judged the situation to be a threat to democracy, a threat to our core values, and that's why we acted against it. But at the same time, we tried to be sensitive to the fact that some of our members actually disagree with what we do. I think wrongly disagree, but still disagree with what we do, and we try to take into account that sensitivity as well. Uh, the other thing that we do is whenever it's, whenever it's relevant, we act uh, according to what we think would be effective. So for example, in the day before the reasonableness law passed in the Knesset, all the presidents of the universities in Israel uh, had a personal strike. We didn't get paid for that, for that day. Instead, we marched to the Knesset. We had rallies in which we explained why this particular move is wrong. Uh, just as in all other cases, we were not alone. Many other bodies were involved in it. Some of the, as you know, some of the protests in Israel are not just impressive. They are very uh, very, very present across the board with numerous people involved in it, and we were part of it. We do have a unique voice, and we use it when needed. Uh, I would like to end by saying that, like I guess most of you, I don't really know what's going to happen. It's uh, unknown. The government is not clear about what it's going to do next. We have the appeal in the Supreme Court, and we have many, many other things that are happening. I do want to express optimism. It's not a short-term optimism. I don't really know at all what's going to happen in the next, I don't know, three, four, five months. But I think long-term wise, I'm optimistic. And the reason that I'm optimistic is that a very significant majority in Israel, not just the universities, not just the elite, a very significant majority in Israel opposes the moves by the government. And not just that, they, are, they rallied around our uh, declaration of independence, which is essentially a version of liberal democracy. And that significant majority represents a very important force in Israel, not just economically, as you all know, but culturally, socially, and in terms of just about every other facet of life. So I don't really have a script what's going to happen, but I am optimistic that we are going to be just fine and that we are going to stay a liberal democracy. Clearly, 
if a danger arises, we'll voice our opinion and do whatever we can to oppose such things. But I hope and I'm optimistic that this is going to be the case, that Israel will preserve its unique identity and continue to be a thriving liberal democracy on everything else that it entails. I'll be happy to answer any questions, but uh, at least my opening remarks are done and I'm happy to introduce uh, Dan Meridor. I guess I can call you a former politician. You once upon a time was a, a finance minister, the minister of law and uh, many other important roles. We are very lucky to have Dan as the chairman of the board of Truman. And in addition to everything else, he's an astute observer of everything happening in Israel and elsewhere. So I'm sure it will be very interesting. Dan, the, the stage is yours. Thank you, Asher, uh, for your introduction. I'll uh, try to be brief. It is an unprecedented crisis. We are used to political struggles since I remember myself tough struggles on land and peace, on reparation from Germany. The society in many uh, ways was uh, fighting within uh, the political arena. We never had the crisis about the nature of Israel, about who we are. It's not about politics. It's not about a policy. It's about the essence of what Israel is. If you like the essence of Zionism, it's a threat on all that we knew and we thought was agreed and will never be changed. You know, one of the big mistakes of the uh, founding father, so to speak, David Ben-Gurion, who has many uh, rights in history, is that he objected to uh, having a constitution. A big mistake, I would say. And how did we uh, become and say democracy in spite of the fact that there is no constitution? For two reasons. Once we had, first of all, we had common values that were agreed. Second, we agreed about the rules of the game. So even if there is no formal constitution, if the common values are common really agreed, like democracy, human rights, independent judiciary, and so forth. And there is an understanding that we accept the vote of uh, the voters, we accept the judgment of the court, we can live together. There is a change now and the beginning of a revolution, in fact, to try to make Israel a different country. It is an attack on these basic values. I'll give you the following uh, example. If an Israeli politician today speaks for democracy, human rights, rule of law, he would be depicted as a leftist. These were the words that Menachem Begin, the head of Likud, used to use every day. This is what he fought for. This was not in any struggle with anybody. Everybody agreed. Now it's not agreed. Now there's a, a, an attack on these values and on the institutions, mainly the legal institutions, they defend them and apply them. And uh, the, this change of values and the attack on the system in the absence of constitution is dangerous. It is so dangerous that even simple people are not lawyers, normal people, not even politicians felt in their instinct that something big and dangerous is happening. And the country for about 30 weeks now is demonstrating, not the opposition, they are doing their job, good or bad. It's the people, it's the lawyers and the doctors and the high tech people and workers. And you see 30 weeks, every Shabbat demonstrations of hundreds of thousands of people all over the country, unprecedented people who understand that their dream and their reality is under threat. The government, uh, uh, either does not understand or does not want to have democracy in its true sense. Because democracy is two things. One, we know the rule of majority. We elect a president or a prime minister or Knesset or Congress and the majority rules. But you know, every dictator had majority from Stalin to Hitler. 
The other elements, not less important, democracy is limits on majority, human rights, group rights, individual rights, and the balancing of these two, what majority can do and what it cannot do to me, the, the citizen, is the essence of democracy. In Israel, because uh, the government and the parliament are in fact one, because mm -hmm. the government is elected by the, gov by the parliament and there is a coalition agreement, the only power that can defend against majority abuse of power is the court, the legal system. And so interestingly, in spite of the fact that there is no constitution, mm -hmm. the main uh, values of democracy have been introduced to our system by the court. Mm -hmm. You may not know, shamefully, in no basic law of Israel, there is a basic statement like all people are equal before the law. Don't discriminate. Or what Americans would call First Amendment, right to speak, to say your opinion. It's not there because for some people, men and women are not equal, Arab and Jew are not equal, gay and straight are not equal. This is that bad. The court did it. Knesset did not did it. The court did it along the years. So the attack is now on those institutions, mainly the court, the legal system as a whole, attorney general uh, that represents and, and defends those basic values. Politically, what happened is shamefully that uh, the Likud party, my party for many years, that was the main defender and supporter of the court and the legal system and always aspired to empower the Supreme Court with the right to overview uh, uh, laws of the Knesset, as our founder Menachem Begin used to say, and I happened to be the Minister of Justice who initiated what we call here the Constitutional Revolution of 92, where the court was given, in fact, the right to overview laws and say whether they are constitutional or not. The Likud party uh, changed its uh, policy 180 degrees. And they are the main attackers now, not defenders of the legal system. It unfortunately it has to do with one personality, the Prime Minister today, Mr. Netanyahu, he used to say the things I'm saying until four years ago. He would defend the court, the legal system, never, never messed around with them. When he was a suspect, then interrogated, then indicted, he is after the system. And he tells a story, a wrong story, in simple words, a lie, that this whole thing is an attack on him personally, fake uh, evidence, and no uh, grounds for indictment, and he attacks the police, the police chief, a settler in his past and religious Jew for being a leftist and, and attacking him personally, the head of the state attorney office, again a, a graduate of yeshiva, Netiv Meir, as a leftist, the attorney general, who was his secretary of the cabinet and chose by him uh, as a leftist, although he's religious Jew as well, and they, uh, in the court, they are all suspect of being uh, leftist after him. And the problem is not that the, the defendant says it. The problem is the man of great influence is saying it. And many people follow him. You may have heard something not far from it in America, but we have it here in Israel. So the attacks on the system has to do with changing the basic laws, taking from the court the right of uh, uh, looking over and criticizing and maybe even rescinding or abolishing laws that, that infringe on human rights and uh, attacking the legal system. There's a, a great balance against corruption in the government, attack on the police. Politically, it's not only the Likud has changed dramatically from one side to the other, Daniel created a coalition which in itself was a great shame and damage. You know, there was an American Jew who made the Aliyah to Israel in the early 80s called Meir Kahana a racist, and uh, we banned him in the Knesset in the initiation of Likud from running to the Knesset because we said in a Jewish state, inciting racism is not allowed. You can be left, right, land, peace. You can't be a racist and incite racism. And he was out, and his people and disciples, Meir Kahana. Netanyahu needed them to try to get majority, and he legitimized them. And now they have in their hands people who speak racist language the police, minister of finance, minister who says, my wife will not share a room with an Arab. 
in hospital. Uh, so it's a deep and troubling development. The government of people who are some of them racist, some of them messianic, they think that God will solve everything, and democracy is just a game for them. And the Likud, and the Haredim, the ultra-Orthodox, who never cared much about equality and other basic values. But this is the struggle. It's unprecedented. I never thought we'll get that low down. But the uh, upside, the bright side, is the resistance, and, uh, genuine and clear resistance, very powerful of the people of Israel. And it forced the government to back somewhat, and they couldn't get the whole idea and the whole program through. They did get one thing that was mentioned here, the, the uh, law of unreasonableness. I don't want to go into that, but they promised to continue. So we are in that deep struggle. And uh, I do believe that in the end of the day, the good guys will win. And I think that we see a, a great power in what was seen to be a dead uh, political camp, the liberal camp of the democratic camp of Israel, but it's very much alive and kicking. And we have been able to gather a lot of force. All of us are doing that uh, in many ways. Uh, but let me say something before I end about the damage that was done. Israel was really, and still is, a huge success story historically. You know, you know it, we know it, we live it, we are proud of it. In the last seven months, Israeli economy that was really on the height, reaching unprecedented heights in terms of, of economic growth and the standard of living and startup nation and high tech, you know that, is sliding down very, very seriously and in a damaging way. You don't know when it's going to end. All the economists, including the Bank of Israel governor and the former governors, all appointed by Netanyahu warn against it, and it still goes on with it, the economy is suffering. Uh, the relationship with the, with the world, you saw so Biden treating BB the way that was really shameful for us. How did we get there? The Israeli army, for the first time ever, there are questions about whether to continue volunteering to the army or not. We never had it, with all the difficulties and differences we had. The Israeli society is torn, and you see it all on television. Uh, so we are in a deep trouble. Uh, we are in a deep fight. We are in a conflict and struggle that goes on. Still in the eye of the storm. Uh, I refused until now, and I do refuse to give interviews abroad because I think Israelis will solve it, not American. The Prime Minister think differently, speak to America all the time. But I do speak to Israeli supporters and Jews all over the world, including this gathering. I don't want you to help us in that way. I think we should sort it out. But you need to understand, this is the fight we are fighting. Uh, the whole dream that we have been dreaming and the realization that was going on quite well uh, of the story of Israel is now being discussed or being at, a, at stake. And we need to continue the struggle, not stopping for a minute until uh, not in too long a time from now, we'll win this uh, uh, struggle and keep Israel what we always loved it to be and hopefully it will be in the future. Now I want to uh, present to you uh, Professor uh, Neta Barak Koren uh, from the Hebrew University Faculty of Law, the same faculty I graduated from many, many years ago. She's of the more serious and younger generation, of course, than I was. And she is uh, an expert in, in, in constitutional law and in cognitive sciences. And uh, I'm sure we'll hear from the important things we haven't heard so far. Neta, please. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, unfortunately, we can't see you all, but uh, I'm delighted to see so many names um, and to have so many people uh, today with us. Um, I want to first say that the, the, the time we have will not allow me, unfortunately, to answer all of the really great questions in the Q&A. Um, and, and we will only be able to select a few, but we will definitely send you resources afterwards um, uh, to help continue the conversation in various ways. Um, I wanna talk um, in the 15 minutes that I have about the path forward. And I wanna divide my comments to two parts. First, the concrete uh, milestones that we are about to face in the upcoming um, 
month, month and a half, maybe two months. The timeline is not exactly clear, but I'll explain in a minute. In a minute. Um, and then the longer horizon or time frame, uh, which is, I think, the vastly more important question, which is what is our game plan for the future Israel go going forward, given the um, immense uh, crisis that engulfs us all right now? So, but first, let's talk about the concrete uh, uh, and 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 near uh, horizon. Uh, what uh, we have been uh, seeing or having in the past uh, week and and even today and going into the upcoming months um, in terms of constitutional law and the constitutional crisis concretely um, is two major uh, legal events. Uh, the first uh, that uh, is not not in the order uh, of, 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 of legislation, uh, but talking about it in, in the order of, of cases litigated now in the, in the Supreme Court. Just today, the Supreme Court held oral hearings um, regarding the constitutionality of basic law um, incapacity to serve as prime minister. Um, and we might be getting a, a first decision from the Supreme Court on uh, one of the first uh, constitutional amendments to have passed the current Knesset as a result of this of this hearing, maybe maybe even in the in the next couple of days, maybe maybe in the next uh, weeks. Um, so this is a, the first sort of constitutional matter that is fastly approaching towards a constitutional crisis potentially. And the second, uh, which is the amendment to basic law, the judiciary uh, that cancelled the ability to review government and ministerial decisions on grounds of reasonableness. That's the reasonableness amendment. Um, there are already petitions filed before the Supreme Court with respect to that amendment. And the Supreme Court scheduled oral hearing in these petitions for September 12th. Uh, for the first time in history, the court decided, the Chief Justice decided that the court is going to hear those petitions um, in a full panel of all of its justices. The Supreme Court of Israel, unlike, for example, the American or Canadian Supreme Courts, uh, almost never sits in a full panel. It's a 15-member court, um, and it usually sits in panels that range from three to five. Sometimes the largest so far has been 13, um, and it only happened one time in history. Um, so it has it uses expanded panels, but it never sat in such a big panel in a panel of all of the justices. Both of these, both of these concrete legal events could uh, could throw us into what many people have called constitutional crisis um, in the past, and the term is typically being used um, uh, to 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 refer to a clash between the judiciary and the executive or the Knesset. As um, Mr. Meridor mentioned before, uh, the two are, are, are combined to a large, to large extent in Israel under our current parliamentary structure. Um, and the, the, the term constitutional crisis is typically used in Israel to, to refer to a scenario where the court will decide that a law is unconstitutional, a basic law is unconstitutional, and the government will choose not to respect or adhere to the decision. And then the major question is, what, what's next? I mean, what will, what will the police do? What will the army do? What will the security forces do? What will citizens do as a result of such a uh, collision between, between two central branches? Uh, of, 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 of the government. Um, we're, no, we're not there yet, um, but these two petitions are, could mm -hmm. be the first steps to take us there. Um, what I wanna say is, what I wanna do is sort of map the various options um, uh, that could, could come out of, of these petitions um, and then and then talk about uh, uh, the longer term and how we might think about coming out of the crisis in a fuller and better way. So what are the options that the, that the Israeli Supreme Court faces? 
the first thing it could do, and I'm not saying them by, you know, in order of, of likelihood, just in terms of analytical options. The first thing it could do is to declare the basic laws, one of them or, or both of them, unconstitutional. It's important to say that this has never been done by the Israeli Supreme Court so far. The court has toyed with the idea that it has the authority to declare basic laws as unconstitutional. It's important to know that Israel doesn't have a full written rigid constitution. There are no rules um, that uh, lay any kind of restriction on the power of the Knesset to enact and amend basic laws. So the Knesset can amend a basic law with a majority of two to one in, in the Knesset. There's no special majority or special procedure. Um, the only thing that separates a basic law from a regular law formally is just a title, whether it starts with the word basic law. But throughout the long history of the legislation of basic laws, typically the Knesset legislated them in a consensual process over several years, uh, did a very serious, uh, did a very serious um, uh, uh, legislative work. Um, and this has been pretty much the process for almost all uh, basic laws that were enacted uh, from scratch over the years. Um, but we have seen a deterioration of that um, process in the past um, 10 years or so. We have been seeing a process by which the Knesset, multiple Knessets, not, not just this Knesset, multiple Knessets, multiple coalitions, starting to amend basic laws very, very hastily in a very fast process, sometimes over 48 hours, over, over 72 hours, Basic laws gets amended uh, for various uh, uh, narrow political reasons. Again, this is this hasn't started with the current Knesset. As a result of that, we have seen uh, a growing number of remarks by the Supreme Court that maybe there could be constitutional review of basic laws. Um, they have never done that so far. This is one avenue that they might choose to uh, go in. Personally, and I'll say this is contested among constitutional law professors in Israel, I personally think that they don't have a good enough basis to walk this path uh, based on their own uh, past precedents. Another option that they could have, and they sort of hinted about on this option today in oral hearing regarding the constitutionality of basic law incapacity to serve as prime minister that greatly narrowed the ability to use the, the option of declaring incapacitation of the prime minister in order to remove a prime minister from office, they might declare um, that, the, that the law will enter into an effect, not now, not immediately as the Knesset intended it to, but only from the only starting the, the next, the subsequent Knesset, for example. So this is something that they hinted they, they might wanna do. They said that the law is personal they was uh, meant to serve the narrow needs of the current prime minister, and maybe, um, maybe an amendment to that is to just declare that it's entry into an effect um, uh, in order to be a general norm is from the next subsequent Knesset. Um, again, this is something that they hinted to as a doctrine in previous decisions, but they never actually applied it in such a way. It will be, it will be a precedent to do that now. Um, another option they could do, they could they could walk the path of interpreting the, the basic line or to remove some all kinds of tensions. So one of the motives of the current coalition government in legislating this amendment to the basic law was um, to, to make sure that, uh, that the attorney general cannot declare the prime minister incapacitated to fulfill its role because of uh, disagreements about its conflict of interest um, uh, agreement. Um, so one thing that the justices could say, they could say the law stands, the law is good, uh, regardless of how good we think it is as a constitutional arrangement, but it's not unconstitutional. But the prime minister is still subject to his conflict of, of interest agreement, and he cannot decide that he's not uh, to abide by it just because of this basic law. And then the, th the fourth option, they could just reject the petitions and they can leave room for future litigation, saying something like, you know, if in the future the prime minister will do something that the attorney general or others think make him incapacitated to fulfill his, his role, then, then, you know, we'll intervene. We're not, we're not saying we will we'll never intervene, but we're not intervening now. And the same sort of options 
you know, could could be applied uh, with the respective changes to reasonableness as well. So to, to differentiate between the sort of the, the major questions and the uh, uh, challenges of application. So sometimes we use this the distinction between a challenge um, in principle and a challenge as applied. They could reject the petitions in principle as theoretical, as maybe not ripe for litigation, and could leave room for as applied challenges later on. So this was a map of the options that the, co the court has with respect of the current petitions in the current time frame. But I want to say something that I think is crucial here is that regardless of what the court choose to do, and not because it's not important, uh, but because this would not exhaust uh, the crisis that we're in, and in fact, we're already in a constitutional crisis, even if we hadn't reached the stage where the two branches or the three branches of government directly collide. Um, and we are in a constitutional crisis that is even broader than simply just being a constitutional crisis. We're in the midst of social and political and economic and military and even a diplomatic crisis. Um, and this crisis cannot be remedied in a Supreme Court decision or by an act of legislation of the Knesset. I mean, I wish it was possible to remedy this social crisis with, an, with legislation of the Knesset or with a Supreme Court decision. It's not possible because the crisis has by now broadened and widened to a much, much, much broader scope uh, than it was when it started in January 4th when Minister of Justice uh, Levine first announced his major plans. And what I want to say is, is when we're actually looking at the long term, and here I, you know, here I want to step into the second part of my remarks, and I'm only going to do it briefly, but when we're thinking of the long term and when we're thinking of the actual path forward, there is really no other option than to create um, a constitutional process that will be able to achieve two things. First, to remedy, mend, heal the social covenant, the very, very fraught social uh, fracture uh, that we have we have been finding ourselves engulfed in, which is probably the most severe in the history of the state of Israel. When so many people, when so many groups from both the right and the left feel that the social covenant that has been connecting everybody together has been eroded and fractured, uh, the kind of process that we need in order to heal that is, is much deeper and much wider um, than the, the processes that we currently have available for us, the sort of legal or legislative processes. And, and that is also because what we have seen in the past seven months is that the Knesset, even if fully able to legislate, which it just did a few times, is unable to heal that social crisis. So it's not a power that the Knesset currently is able to exercise, not because it cannot formally, but because empirically uh, we, we see that it's unable to do that. The Knesset legislates in the fractures just grow deeper as a result of that. Um, and this is a shared, this is a shared understanding now, both among left and right supporters and opponents of the reform. So the kind of solution that um, I have been working on personally and developing uh, with colleagues in and outside of the Hebrew University, and happy to send you some materials about that in the chat and later on, is to establish in Israel, re-establish in Israel, uh, bring to life the Constituent Assembly. The Constituent Assembly has uh, first appeared in Israel's Declaration of Independence as the body that was supposed to write a constitution for Israel. And there were elections held for the Constituent Assembly in 1949, just after the War of Independence. It chose not to do that. It chose not to write a constitution for Israel. It renamed itself into the first Knesset and decided that one day, maybe, all of the Knessets together, and then one day, maybe, um, a constitution will be written chapter by chapter for Israel. Now, the Knessets have done marvelous work over the years, legislating many basic laws, but we see where we are now. What we propose is to reconvene, reestablish the constituent assembly. Uh, uh, we have done in the past uh, few months very intensive uh, research and consultation and collaboration process to create a concrete proposal to allow um, 
for the establishment of such an assembly. Our proposal deals with everything from election to powers, to procedures, to decision-making rules, to referendum, how the process is supposed to start and how it's supposed to end. Um, and uh, me and my colleagues are currently working uh, both in terms of uh, uh, broadening public support for, for this initiative and political support for this initiative in order to hopefully uh, allow it to happen. Um, the, the key insight here is that we don't just have a constitutional crisis. We have both a social and a constitutional crisis. And if we want to solve this crisis, we need both a social and institutional solution. So to create a body that will be able to succeed where the Knesset is currently failing could both rejuvenate the people's trust in democracy and the actual ability of democracy to save itself from the crisis it's currently facing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, as everyone can imagine, we have quite a few questions. Uh, we'll try to get to as many as we can. I'd like to start with uh, the first question, and this is for all panelists. So if everyone could answer and unmute, that would be great. What are the panelists' view of the chances of another election in the next few months? And if so, will the outcome be materially different as a result of the current recent events? Asher, would you like to start? Well, I'm, as I said, I'm not a political player and I'm not going to get into political guesses. I'll let uh, Dan or Neta take that answer. Well, I have been in politics uh, for many years of my life, but I share with the uh, Asher the total ignorance regarding what may happen regarding election. I don't know. Uh, I don't think Netanyahu wants to have elections. And I think all his actions and all his maneuvers are successfully aimed at continuing uh, his rule in the government, and he would pay every price to keep the government together. If uh, it falls somehow for some reason, uh, the good question is whether we're going to see different results. According to the polls, yes. According to the polls, if they are to be credited, uh, the opposition of now has a clear majority over the government of now. But these are polls, and we haven't started the campaigns, and you don't know. The interesting question is, I would, I would end, I would, in a Jewish way, answer with a question. The question is, the huge forces of society that has been very organized and, and effective in demonstrating and, and all over the country, if they are able to transform themselves into a political force, uh, to change the political map and say, this is our answer, this is our response, these are our proposals, then there may be a shift change, a big, big change in the map altogether. This is still yet to be seen. And if they are, if they want to do this, and if they are smart, they won't do it now. They need to do it when elections are, are declared. And will this happen or not? I don't know. An interesting other question is, Netanyahu, people say, is supposed to start giving evidence as the first defendant in his criminal trial, I believe in October. I don't know whether it's true. This is what people say. Many people say he wants to avoid this. One way is, of course, to have a plea bargain, which was offered to him by his own lawyer, and he declined it so far. Will October, if this is the time frame, do something? Will he uh, resign? Will he uh, make a plea bargain and resign? Then we see a totally different ball game. But it's all speculation now, and I'll go to my first statement. I don't know. Thank you. Um, Professor Cohen, why do you think there are many reasons to believe that Israel will continue to be a democracy? Well, as I said before, I look at what happened in Israel. Above and beyond the crisis, what you see is some sort of an assembly of all the forces that support liberal democracy, liberal Jewish democracy, by the way, but nonetheless liberal democracy. And you see it not just for older people, but you see it also for the younger generation. You see a presence of a large number of people that support the essential declaration of independence, where you see the words democracy and the word Jewish state together. 
that this is how Israel managed so far. And I think what we see is very clear signs that these forces will continue to push forward. I'm not saying that there are no dangers, by the way. I'm hopeful and optimistic, but I'm not saying that this is the only scenario. I think it's a likely scenario given what we saw. Thank you. Professor Barak Koren, what are a couple of steps required to activate a constituent assembly such as you propose? Great. So what we propose is that the Knesset will uh, convene um, a new committee in the Knesset that will be designated to uh, legislate uh, the, the, the structure of the Constituent Assembly. We propose that this, that this new committee will include representatives of all factions in the Knesset. This is uh, uncommon in the Knesset. I mean, there is one committee in the Knesset that includes representatives of all factions, but most of the so, uh, professional committees in the Knesset typically include members of opposition coalition, but not all factions. And, uh, and the, the, the Knesset will legislate um, either a law or a basic law. It could also maybe be just a decision. Sometimes the Knesset can issue decisions in constitutional matters that establish the constituent assembly. What we propose will be the first step afterwards is that there will be um, uh, elections for the Constituent Assembly. Uh, we propose a structure by which uh, the Constituent Assembly is jointly appointed by the current Knesset and by the general public. Third of the Constituent Assembly will be directly appointed by the current Knesset. Uh, the, different parties, the different parties will be able to appoint uh, representatives based on their relative share of the Knesset. So the Likud will be able to appoint uh, for example, seven members for the Constituent Assembly and, and the Labour Party will be able to appoint one or two. Um, and then two thirds will be elected by the public in a special general elections that will be designated specifically for that purpose, uh, for, held for the first time since 1949. Because in every election system, we typically primarily uh, cast a ballot based on who we want to be prime minister, who we want to be the ruling coalition, uh, we never do that first and foremost based on you know what kind of constitutional arrangements we want, what kind of basic rules of the democratic game we want. We just accept them as given and think about the next steps. Who do we want to govern us? Um, so this fundamental question that is currently really at the heat um, of the of the demonstrations and debate and legislation for the past seven months is not something that the Israeli public directly voted on ever since 1949. Um, so because of the, the intensity of the crisis. We believe that it it merits um, uh, these this this special general elections, and then 100 people will uh, ultimately form the constituent assembly, and the process will take off from there. Again, I'm happy happy to post in the chat um, a link to the proposal. Okay, a question for Dan and Netta: Why is reasonability so important? It has been a point of contention for many years in Israel, and even people who are now in the opposition have previously called to cancel it claiming for legal activism of the Supreme Court? Well, uh, first of all, I think the issue of reasonableness cannot be taken separately. It's part of a plan that was declared openly by the government. The main the thrust of it is to weaken the Supreme Court to allow the government freedom in what they do without any limits. Whether the Supreme Court in reasonableness, whether the way that the Knesset will have a a right of appeal on the Supreme Court in a way, uh, or whether it's uh, limiting the power of the Attorney General, it can't be taken separately. It's part of a whole game. Second, uh, what does it mean that reasonableness uh, will not be a good, a good cause uh, to be examined? Reasonableness, by the way, is a, is a legal term that comes of hundreds of years from England and other places, the reasonable man in many ways. The government, when they have a power to do something, they were not given this power by God. They were given by the law. And the law says that they need to do something, I think, in a reasonable way. I'll give an example of political appointments that were very, uh, very corrupting the system in a way. If uh, one wants to appoint uh, a minister who is minister of education, he wants to appoint somebody to be in charge of English studies in schools. Then he appoints somebody who has never learned English. 
There's no reason to say no, but one, it's totally unreasonable. And he will do it because this guy supported him, financed him, or is part of his party. There are things that the government should not ask to be free from reasonable thinking. The court in Israel, in my view, is uh, quite passive, not active. The court was active in the first years when they told the government that they cannot decide on the balance of security and, and human rights in closing down papers and other things uh, with no constitution. I said earlier, the idea of equality, the government never agreed to it. The Knesset never agreed to it. The court decided that equality is part of our, 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 our legal system or the freedom of expression, First Amendment. It's all the court. So uh, the court now, uh, the rhetoric is sometimes is high. I don't think it's active at all. There are very few cases where reasonableness in, in, in decisions like this was used or unreasonableness. It's not one should even be more accurate. The, the term is extreme unreasonableness, is really unreasonable. If something is uh, decided that no reasonable person would do, it's not in the power of the, of the government to do it. They were not given this force to do, to act unreasonably. Now, if it were only this, that the court is too active or too passive. It's a legitimate debate. If it were done separately without the whole uh, host of, of threats that is around it, one could discuss it. I would have one opinion, maybe uh, other lawyers with other opinions, fine. This is not it. They want the court not to interfere with their absolute uh, discretion. This is not democracy. It's, uh, it's majority rule and no democracy. Democracy needs checks and balances. They don't want any check or any balance. They want the, the, the uh, press or the communication system to be under their control, can give you statements. They want to go into it. They want to weaken it. They did weaken the, the, uh, the, uh, um, the uh, controller, the state controller. They want to weaken the, the attorney general. They want to weaken the court. They want to be free of limits. And, you know, power tends to corrupt, said Lord Tecton. Absolute power corrupts, absolutely. And we don't need corruption. The court fought it. And reasonableness is one of the ways when you can't prove bribe or, you, or wrong uh, consideration that something that is totally unreasonable should not be allowed. Thank you, Dan. We have another question for you. Um, should the opposition aspire to reach a compromise? Is it possible to reach a compromise? If you ask me, I, I, I say something very unpopular. Most people want to compromise. Most people want peace in all countries, including in my country. I don't think there's a compromise between those who want to ruin democracy and those who want to maintain it. If it were only the extent of courts uh, using the, uh, the cause of unreasonableness, this is something that can be discussed. But this is not what they want. They say what they want. And I don't think there is, in, I mean, it's nice to talk about compromise you may get the majority of the election if you offer compromise. In fact, it's it's sort of black and white. It's not that they want to reform the system in a certain way and we want some different reform. They want to destroy the system that we built. This is simple. Uh, I, again, I don't want to go into quotation, you hear it. They want to allow values that we don't think that are, are normal in, in a democratic country. So I don't think there's really compromise. In the end, there will be a decision. Uh, and uh, if there were readiness to go uh, for the... Uh, uh, proposal that uh, that Professor Barack Koren uh, mentioned. This is a, a good idea. Will there be a, a readiness to give from the Knesset the power to the people in a way to have a diff different body, constituting body, and have a constitution? And if it's uh, in in good faith, in, that's uh, is to say, not only politics, but really thinking about the values of the state of Israel and the nature of the Jewish and democratic state, then it's a good idea because maybe we can correct. The uh, mistake of the, the early the early uh, leaders for not having constitution. This is a good thing. I am uh, I'm not sure it will work, but I think the idea is a good one. Thank you. Um, we're going to to ask one final question, and this is for all panelists. So anybody who would like to answer, please jump in. Um, I'd also like to mention before we go into the last question that everyone will receive a follow up email after this webinar with a link to the video. It will be posted to YouTube. Um, in addition, we will also link to a document written by Professor Barack Corin, so you can find some additional information there. Just wanted to throw that in. Okay, here is our final question. For years before the reform, there's been perspective across political persuasions that the Supreme Court held too much power. 
Key to a functioning democracy is checks and balances on power. Can you please explain what the check and balance on the Supreme Court is? Unlike many liberal democracies, Israel's Supreme Court has the power to elect their own justices, challenge laws without true standing, etc. My understanding is, even after this recent reform, it still has more power than most liberal democracies. If you can discuss this view, that would be very helpful. Let me start taking this question, um, which is a great one. So I think we need to uh, fit first fix maybe uh, at least uh, one factual uh, issue about the description of the question and then maybe provide a little bit of background on, on the Supreme Court and its and the sort of amount of power it, 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 it actually has. Um, so first, it's a very common saying, the Supreme Court justices elect themselves into position. This is factually wrong. It has always been wrong, but for but for a while, um, it has reflected at least to some extent the political reality. Uh, so, and I and I saw there was a, also an early question about the judicial appointment committee. So I, maybe it's a good idea to say a, a few things about that. Justices in Israel, to all levels of the judiciary, including the Supreme Court, are appointed by a nine-member committee, uh, which has been established early on at the first years uh, uh, um, to the existence of Israel, early in the 50s. Um, and these nine member members are the Minister of Justice and another minister from the government, two members of the Knesset, typically but not always one of the coalition and one of the opposition, three Supreme Court justices out of the nine, and two members of the bar. So it's a nine-member committee. And those of you who were quick to do the math will see that it has five members of the legal professions and four elected politicians uh, forming the committee. So the Knesset itself chose to give a little bit of an edge to the legal profession over the elected politicians in the committee. Now, but it's still not any by any means the justices appointing themselves. There are three out of the nine votes. Now for many years, for a, a, a long period of time, um, the, the, the political structure um, within the committee um, was such that the lawyers and the justices often collaborated um, in uh, agreeing on candidates that they favored and the politicians, even if they really wanted somebody else or really did, didn't want one of the sort of uh, uh, legal uh, uh, camp appointees, uh, didn't have a lot to do. Uh, this, was, this has changed uh, dramatically. Uh, in, a, in an amendment to basic law, the, judi the judiciary that is often not mentioned by people making this argument, um, in 2008, uh, former Minister of Justice Gideon Saar, who's now a member of the opposition, uh, was able to uh, initiate and then pass through the Knesset an amendment that said that if the, if the committee appoints members to the Supreme Court, then it must do so uh, in a supermajority of seven out of the nine members. That meant that the balance shifted such that now justices cannot be appointed to the Supreme Court without the approval of the coalition in the committee um, and the, the representatives of the coalition. And also important to mention is that all of the justices in the current court, except for Chief Justice Hayut, were appointed after this amendment entered into effect. So 14 of the 15 were elected after this amendment went into effect. And what we have now is the most politically balanced and religiously diverse court that we've ever had, with if you go through the math and you go through the personalities, you sort of try to classify the justices to camps, which I often don't like to do because it's a little bit shallow, maybe not just a little bit. But what you see is that we have a court that is evenly balanced between conservatives and liberals, both in terms of how the justices were peached to the community and also in terms of uh, what they actually did in their decision. So we have justices that think that the Supreme Court has no ability to rule about the constitutionality of constitutional amendments, justices that uh, believe in a very restrained judicial review, as well as liberal justices, and it's really evenly split. 
Um, we also have more religious justices than there are share of the population. We have more Mizrahi justices than we've ever had. We still have only one Arab justice. And so in that front, we haven't advanced at all in terms of diversity. We have many, many women uh, as part of the judiciary. So it's probably the most diverse court we've ever had. Now, how much court does, how much power does the court has? Look, this is always a very difficult question to answer. The court in Israel doesn't select its own cases, unlike the Canadian or the American court. So it doesn't have this power. It hears more than 10,000 cases a year. So more than 10,000 new cases are submitted to the court every year. Only a fraction of these cases uh, are constitutional cases. And it rejects the vast majority of constitutional appeals or petitions it gets. Does it mean that he doesn't actually exercise power? Does it mean that he doesn't actually have power? Of course, it doesn't mean that. The court has expanded its powers considerably uh, uh, over the years, uh, but the court is still is still uh, the place of last resort. And whereas the government makes hundreds of decisions a day and the cabinet makes um, tens uh, and dozens of decisions a week and the Knesset can legislate any law it wants, a very small fraction of these decisions and laws actually reach the Supreme Court. So when we're looking at the balance of powers between the different branches, it's also important to, to note and to take appreciation of the very different division of labor between the role of the judiciary and the role of the elected branches. It doesn't mean that the Supreme Court did not expand its power in the sort of document I placed in the Q&A and that you'll get you know, sort of go through the historical process of how it ex expanded its powers. I definitely, I am in the camp that thinks that there, there is room for, uh, for rebalancing the structure of powers between the court and the Knesset and the government, but that doesn't make the court the most, the most powerful institution um, uh, or even necessarily um, uh, in, in, in comparative terms, more powerful than other Supreme Courts around the world um, as many people uh, are, are arguing. Uh, what we do need is a very balanced system of, 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 of powers, and we don't have it. We don't have it now. Uh, and we don't have it for, se for several reasons. Some of them are, lies within the Supreme Court and others lie within the two intermingled uh, relationship of the Knesset and uh, the cabinet. Uh, thank you, Netta, and thank you, Dan and Asher, for joining us today and for sharing your insights, your expertise, your opinions, and your sense of what might come next. We know that uh, there were many questions we were not able to address today. We're going to look into further opportunities to explain further the legal and political issues that are in play in some future webinars. Um, hopefully today provided some insights into what these three experts and university leaders expect uh, for the next couple of days, weeks, and months. I want to thank Netta and Dan and Asher again for addressing us and my thanks to all of you for joining us as well. A quick reminder that we are going to make today's recorded seminar available to all of you as well as some of the materials that Netta has already shared. We'll make sure that you have access to them. Thank you very much once again and we look forward to seeing you soon.